Hi, my name is John Powers and I'm a scientist studying how climate change is affecting plant pollinator interactions in the Colorado Rockies. But today we'll be zooming way out from species interactions to discuss a framework for understanding how climate change is impacting life on Earth. Before listening to this lecture, you should read the 2016 review article by a group of scientists that summarizes what we know about how ecosystems have responded to global warming so far. Then answer the self-guided reading questions. As you read, try to mentally place the lists of example studies into categories that make sense to you, and see if those match up with what I present here. Ultimately, the bigger goal is to find a framework for organizing the environmental news that bombards us every day and be able to critically evaluate a range of proposed solutions. Every day we wake up to more and more headlines that tell us that some part of our environment is failing to keep up with human impacts, or people are in danger from a newly created environmental threat, or someone has a quick fix that will get us out of this mess as long as we don't mind recycling or maybe moving to Mars. And I'll admit scientists and science communicators are partly to blame for the chaotic messaging around climate change. Researchers work in silos and scientists get excited about demonstrating esoteric relationships, like how the snow melting earlier is making nectar evaporate in the sun and how that impacts how many pollen grains hummingbirds deposit on flowers. Um, that's my research. Just look at the review article you read for a wall of examples that are only loosely tied together. If you don't already understand the smaller systems being analyzed, it can be hard to put them together and see what is new or meaningful. So the art of understanding environmental crises is placing all of these disparate headlines into a network of common ideas that explain how we impact nature and how nature impacts us. That's what ecology tries to do. The cool part is many of the concepts developed to model food webs and thermal tolerances in the environment can be applied directly to human systems and show us exactly how we're creating problems or how to find solutions. I'm going to divide this lecture into a few key ideas that have helped me sort through the noise for the signal. The first is that life from the cells in plankton colonies to the global biosphere can be understood as a system. Systems are made of parts that interact with a few simple rules to create complexity and sometimes unexpected behavior. In this model called systems ecology, we can think of cells, individuals, or cities as cogs in a machine. The parts of the machine are linked together by flows of constantly moving energy and matter. Each part takes certain inputs like nutrients or oxygen or lumber, and according to the instructions in the genes or the structure of their population, turns them into outputs like cell walls or carbon dioxide or school buildings that then serve as inputs for other parts of the machine. Even starting from very basic parts, systems can get quite complex in how they behave. For example, an individual termite actually knows nothing about building a termite mound. No mental bl blueprints or commanders to follow, but if all the termites follow a few rules about placing bits of mud, they can build a mound. The key idea is that form follows function. The organization or structure of a virus or a termite mound or a city determines how it works and how it reacts to stress. That was all pretty abstract, so it helps to look at concrete examples of systems at different scales. Here's one that I learned in intro biology about a chemical system that's part of photosynthesis. At the time, I had a hard time appreciating its importance because the focus was on the specific elements, but we gain a lot of power by knowing how all of the pieces fit together and by paying attention to the flow of arrows instead of the blobs. This system, called Photosystem 1, is used by plants and algae to harvest light energy from the sun, and is similar across thousands of species, likely evolving in the earliest bacteria. It takes sunlight as input, and using a chain of molecules bounces electrons around until they make energy-dense ATP that the cell can use to make sugar. Let's say that you're trying to get rid of weeds on your farm. If you follow the electrons along the arrows, you can see that there are many ways to disrupt this system. You could put shade cloth over the weeds, or use an herbicide that leads to a buildup of outputs like ATP, or use another herbicide to break one of the steps in the chain. But before we had this nice textbook model, this process was invisible to us. The model needs to be conceptualized many times and tested with experiments many more times to establish what components were part of the system and how they interacted. So the next question is, how do we determine a system's structure from disconnected data points? That really boils down to breaking the system or taking it apart. 
which I, I would argue humans are really good at. We're going to use the Chicago River as an example to think about developing models of systems. Every year on St. Patrick's Day, Chicago dumps a bunch of green dye in the river. Nowadays, they use a non-toxic plant-based dye, but it used to be an oil-based dye, which you can imagine the fish weren't very happy about. The first tool you can use to investigate a system are its dynamics, or how its inputs and outputs and internal pools change over time. Particularly, if you disturb a system with some stressor, how does it respond? Does the system return to a stable baseline, or is it chaotic, moving in unpredictable ways to a new state? If you dump a lot of green dye in the river, does it disappear quickly or hang around for a week? How much dye do you have to put in before all the fish go belly up? Next, you can use a technique called the iceberg model. It's called an iceberg because you can take events or headlines or data points that are visible at the surface and think about broad patterns that tell you about the system hidden below. If the fish only die when you add dye on a warm day, maybe that tells you something about the tolerances of the fish to multiple stressors. You can also look for feedback loops in the system. If everyone who sees the green river gets excited and dumps their homemade green dye into it, the river will get exponentially greener in a reinforcing feedback loop. A reinforcing feedback loop is where adding something leads to more of that something. If lake water keeps spilling into the river and returns it to being clear, you have a balancing feedback loop where adding something leads to less of that something. Finally, you can take all of your knowledge and inferences and draw a web diagram that shows the parts of the system, the river, the lake, the fish, the temperature, the Irish, and how they are connected by cause and effect. To figure out which flows and pools in the system depend on each other, you can try deleting some components in the system. As Gandalf once said, he that breaks a thing to find out what it is has joined the path of wisdom. Now let's use these same four tools on climate change. The first thing to notice about dynamics in the climate system is that carbon emission rates into the atmosphere are higher than the world has ever seen. The only events that come close are massive volcanic eruptions, and those usually peter out and let the atmosphere recover. So the question becomes, will species be able to adapt as quickly as the planet is warming, or will they evolve or migrate too slowly? Instead of reacting to individual headlines about species extinctions or destructive hurricanes, we can look deeper at the iceberg to see how the climate systems and life systems on Earth are structured. What are the common themes in ecology? They usually have something to do with how energy, water, or nutrients move around, either in ecosystems or human societies. Next, we can look at feedback loops that these structures create. Climate scientists have known for a few decades now that there are tipping points in the system where reinforcing feedback loops are starting to take over. Three of these involve how water moves around on the planet. The warmer the oceans are, the more water vapor evaporates to form clouds, which insulate the ocean and keep it warmer, starting a vicious cycle. The less ice there is in the Arctic, the more seawater absorbs sunlight the warmer it gets and the less ice. Trees in the Amazon make their own weather, so the less rainforest, the less water evaporates from leaves to make rain clouds, and the more trees die of drought. Thankfully, nature also has balancing loops like evolution. Species have been able to evolve in sync with slow climate changes in the past, stabilizing a disrupted system, but now warming is happening faster than evolution can manage. As you saw in the paper, food webs and other interactions between species can amplify the effect of climate change on one species to affect the whole ecological community. The extinction of one species breaks the links in the chain, which makes the food web more brittle. You can imagine that if there are only a few species left, they're connected with fewer links and have fewer options when it comes to adapting to climate change. The review paper highlighted that the effects of climate change can be seen at multiple scales. This makes sense if you think of life as a fractal, a system that's made up of smaller systems. When we think of life as a fractal, it makes sense that the changes happening at one scale can move up and down the hierarchy, from individuals all the way up to ecosystems. Ecology boils down all of these levels to a set of energy flows and interactions that can be seen in similar ways. At the individual level, an organism can respond directly by modifying its physiology or morphology, in Colorado, I'm studying how drier summers cause plants to make more compact leaves to decrease their water consumption. While this helps the plants stay alive, it's not always great for reproduction and the viability of populations in the long term. 
Populations are group of organisms of the same species that reproduce with each other. One way populations can react to global warming is through adaptation. Through natural selection, they evolve new versions of genes that increase their fitness in the new environment. But they can only do that with time and plenty of genetic diversity to start from. Populations can also shift their timing or phenology of growth, migration, and reproduction to match the new climate. However, interacting species are changing their calendars separately, and this can lead to mismatches between species. Finally, observing population dynamics, we can see that the numbers of individuals of each age and sex are changing in many species. For mobile species like fish, climate change is pushing their geographic ranges farther towards the poles to find cooler water. However, species that are dependent on certain habitats, like these adorable pikas, depend on long winters and productive summers gathering plants on tall peaks. When the climate warms, they're left with no higher elevation to retreat to. In the case of plants, they would ideally migrate poleward, but this is limited by how far their seeds can travel. Scientists are considering assisted migration to help soon-to-be endangered species follow cooler temperatures up mountains or away from the equator. Looking at how climate change is affecting the interactions between species and communities, we're generating new combinations of species that have perhaps never interacted before. Instead of trying to restore nature back to an original set of creatures, we have to think about entirely new communities that can live in modified habitats. To wrap this up, I want to emphasize how we humans fit into ecological systems. If you want to understand how human behavior is affecting the environment, it's much simpler to treat us as yet another animal that just happens to have a few tricks for competing with domesticating, and eating a lot of plants, cows, chickens, and fish. This is a list of just a few of the activities we are engaged in that look similar to those of many other species, just at a larger scale. The important realization here is that not only do these other species now depend on us to maintain their habitat, but we depend on them to clean our water, pollinate our crops, buffer the coast from storms, and feed us. This means we can apply all the same principles of systems ecology to address how climate change affects us, ecosystems, and our relationship with ecosystems. How can we positively interact with other species while they are dealing with global warming? Will we be able to rely on ecosystem services to meet our needs? How can we redistribute resources to transition our energy supplies and mitigate the disaster we created? If we think of all the parts of this diagram in isolation, these questions are very hard, but humans have great power to work with ecosystems and avert an even worse disaster. Let's end by thinking about an ecosystem service, like wetlands filtering stormwater or fungi recycling nutrients in forests, that currently supports a product or activity that you or your community relies on. Is that service affected by climate change? The answer is probably yes. If so, how can we change our society's actions to support that service? I'll leave you with a few resources that I found helpful, especially this short book on thinking in systems that shows how you can apply the tools we learned today to many areas of your life. Thanks for listening and feel free to email me with any questions.